All right. So I do want to keep going with this uh, sermon about, or this the teachings about the Psalms. And uh, I'll bring other verses along here that I hope are helpful to you in your study. I uh, do these, again, uh, not from an academic standpoint or a theoretical standpoint, but from um, a place of a genuine conviction about it, that there is not something like this. There is, this is a, a clear proof of the hand of God in the writing of scripture and the fulfillment of prophecy and things that, you know, are well beyond our capability to, uh, to uh, anticipate and, and write and to bring about. People are always looking for some kind of sign from God. Well, it's, it's right in front of you. It's this Bible. So we wanted to take that pr- approach. And um, I would also bring forward to start our thinking about this, the idea for Matthew 25, you know, in, in the end of that, <clears throat> in the end of that chapter, the Lord speaks about the talents and a master who gave one talent to one servant, you know, two or three to another, five to another, and that each one was to do business until he should return. And those that received multiple talents doubled their income. The uh, one talent man, though, hid it in the ground and... um, He was roundly condemned for that. What he said at Matthew 25, verse 25 is, I was afraid because I knew that you um, gathered where you did not sow. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what what is yours. And, you know, and we have a tendency to think of a talent as some uh, denomination of coin or bill. That's not the case. A talent is a very large sum of money. In today's money, it's something like $350,000, $400,000. So for him to have one talent is not to say he's got this gold coin that he goes and hides in a tree somewhere. I mean, he has enough money that he should, any, you know, semi-intelligent person would put it in the bank. But he's not doing that because he's afraid of losing it. And he already knows that the master is going to come back looking for a return on that money, reaping where he did not sow, gathering where he did not scatter. Well, God is that master. And the talents that he has given us are not our abilities, (laughs) uh, you know, to sing and play piano. Um, They are the scriptures and our understanding in the spirit. And we should not shy away from drawing conclusions in the scriptures, from making connections between what came before and what is now, um, and making application of the scriptures to our lives. uh, Because by doing so, we're the one talent man hiding it in the ground out of fear. Um, He is looking for us to give a return. He is looking to reap where he did not sow and gather where he did not scatter because his word makes a return. It's an investment. And when he gives it to us, he intends for us to use it. It won't be good enough for us to say we received your word. We heard what you said. And, you know, we added nothing to it. We didn't touch it. We wanted it to stay in a pristine state. So here you have it back. That's not what he wants. He wants you to take it and use it. <laughs> live it, live these things. Make application of these things. Fear is a terrible advisor. Certainly in the spirit. And the reason I say this is because, uh, I mean, the reason I say we're, we're looking at drawing conclusions is because there are many other things foretold in Psalm 22 that are very clearly fulfilled in the life of Jesus, even though they are not specifically cited by the apostles in the Gospels or elsewhere as coming from Psalm 22 and being tied to this thing about the Lord. Nonetheless, the fact that Jesus himself called that that, uh, psalm out from the cross ties it to him. 
intricately. And uh, so we certainly are not stepping out of line when we look at it and consider what it says and look then at the life of Christ and see how that is fulfilled. <clears throat> the first example would be, now I'm taking these in Psalm 22 order, but the first example would be the Garden of Gethsemane, which I think is fairly clear from Psalm 22 verses 1 and 2. The first verse, you know, opened with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the second line of that is, why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. And um, it paints that picture of somebody forsaken, somebody forlorn, and it's important to understand what that means. I think a lot of people, probably well-intended, have misinterpreted that in a whole lot of different ways, that uh, God forsook, forsook him or God uh, you know, hid his face from him or didn't look at him. Uh, and then the whole system of theology in you know, modern seminaries and stuff about he became sin and so there was a separation in the Godhead and all this crazy stuff that is not in the Bible anywhere. That's a mistake. But what is true is the record of Matthew 26. Very simply, the sense in which God forsook him is by answering his prayer, and the answer was no. Jesus went with them, Matthew 26, 36 to 39 records, to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And you know the answer, this request is that he not have to go through with crucifixion, that he not have to give his life. That's the request, a very reasonable request from the Son of God and also the Son of Man, somebody who has a body as you and I have a body, who is contemplating the horrendous tortures of the cross is going to ask if there's any other way. That's a very reasonable thing. Nothing wrong with this at all. But his prayer is, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And it was the will of God that he had to do this. Um, you know, Isaiah 53 says it, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Not that it made God happy. That's just an old way of saying God decided. It was his will. So he, it was not possible. He had to drink the cup. The answer to this prayer is no. And this is the sense in which God forsook him. There he is in the garden. He goes back to the disciples and they're asleep. He tells them, sleep, take your rest later on. The hour is already here. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. He continues in 45 to 47. Um, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, with him a great crowd with swords and clubs. So this um, helps us to see exactly what the psalm said. The answer to his prayer is no. He is on the cross. In that sense, he was far from delivering him, far from the words of his groaning, and he did groan. He cried by day, he cried by night. There was no release. Right, Luke 22 records about this Garden of Gethsemane, 39 to 48 here. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. The disciples followed him. He came to the place and said, Pray that you may not enter into temptation, and withdrew from them, about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
So still, the Lord is selfless and will uh, or wants that God's will be done. Although his request is that the cup be removed from him, he is willing to go through with the will of God. And you know, the answer to this is he was not willing to remove that cup from him. The Lord did drink this cup. There appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him, and he, being in agony, prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them asleep for sorrow and said, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And while he was still talking, there came a crowd, the man called Judas, one of the twelve, leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, and Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Yep, that's how it went. But this Jesus was, by night, in agony, so bad that his sweat became huge like drops of blood. It is possible that blood comes out of the uh, skin with sweat, when we are under great distress. So that may be literally what happened, although it says like blood. Either way, I think the point is clear that he is in great distress about what is going to happen here. And that has everything to do with the particulars of crucifixion, some of which we talked about this morning. It is an unbelievably torturous thing. And anybody would do whatever they could to get out of that. But he said, Father, not my will, but your will. And I would look at John 12 about this as well. When he speaks of the same topic, he said, Now is my soul troubled. Uh, troubled. John 12, 27, beginning, My soul is now troubled. And what shall I say? say Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So this is another way of, of wording the same kind of prayer. You know, he said if, it's, if there's any possibility to get out of this, he would like to do that, and yet the will of God be done. It's very much what's being said here in John 12. My soul is now troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this reason, I've come to this hour. There's no turning back. And a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said it had thundered. <laughs> Others said an angel has spoken to him. Now this is how you know that whatever sign people say that they crave is not going to work. It doesn't matter. They say, oh, I need to see this, or I want, no, no, that's not going to make any difference at all. What you need is the Word of God. You need the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Jesus said, this voice has come not for your sake, but, uh, or I'm sorry, rather, has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this is also famously misunderstood, but lifted up is the euphemism for crucified. It's the polite company word for crucified in the ancient world. So when he says, I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself, he's saying he's going to be crucified. And that was understood. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. John understood it, but the crowd did too. And you look at their reactions whenever he would say this. So he knew what was about to happen. And this is the sense in which he was forsaken by God. It isn't that God left him or didn't listen to him or was unconcerned or, you know, was in the bathroom or had fallen asleep or something. And then this crucifixion happens like, no, that's not it. This was the plan. It was always the plan. This was intentional. Continuing in Psalm 22, we take another idea, which is verse 6. But I'm a worm and not a man, 
scorned by mankind, despised by the people. And I find the parallel to this, that idea that carries through the Gospels of away with this fellow. I put fellow in quotes because um, I want to draw attention to the fact that fellow is King James English for fellow human being. In other words, the most we can say about him is he's a human, not an animal. <laughs> so it's not, you know, in King James's day, this is a way of saying that guy is a low life, almost subhuman, is what they're saying. And that's the, and that's the basis of the English drinking song for he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> It's, you can't be a jolly good, low-life subhuman. <laughs> that's not possible. <laughs> but that's what they meant when they said, away with this fellow. This fellow is not fit to live. In King James English, that's what's meant. So that's why Psalm 22, 6 is fulfilled with that idea when he says, I'm a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. And the record of this, um, one record of this would be John 19. Um, there's another record in Luke 23, but we'll look at John 19 first. 14 to 18, the day of preparation it was, day of preparation for the Passover, about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. That is um, Pilate said to the Jews, behold to the Judeans, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said, really? You want me to crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Yeah, them's fighting words, you understand? Because they don't work for Caesar. Pilate works for Caesar. That's a threat. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha, where they crucified him, with him two others, one on either side, Jesus between the two. So he is a fellow because he's numbered among the sinners, the evildoers, the worst of the insurrectionists among them, those that were trying to overthrow Rome, that were slitting the throats of Roman soldiers in the alleyways, that's the nature of the two that were crucified on either side. They were making a statement that this man tried to usurp, usurp the uh, throne from Caesar and therefore had to be executed. And he had to have a sign above that said, this is the king of the Judeans, the would-be king of the Judeans. We put down insurrection like this. They wanted to make a, um, you know, make a lesson out of him, make a... Uh, I forget what the word is for that. Sorry. But you get the idea. In Luke 23, we read this with some additional details. Here, the governor, Pilate, calls together the chief priests, 13 to 16, of Luke 23, the rulers and the people, everybody, and says, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people, and after examining him, as you can see, behold, and when we say as you can see, what we're saying is they've already beaten Jesus. So he's already bloody black and blue. They said, as you can see, we have examined him. I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod. He sent him back to us. So neither did the Roman authority um, local to Judea, um, uh, Jerusalem, do this, nor did, if you will, the appellate, the region, where Herod is the overseer, he sent him back too. Like, we have no charge to bring that warrants the sentence of crucifixion, which is, um, you know, the Romans were, were jerks, but you still had to, to do some pretty bad stuff before they sentenced you to crucifixion. That wasn't just something they did when they were in a bad mood. That was, you did something really heinous. 
Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. So I am going to punish and release him. That was the considered opinion of Pilate. We've examined him. He's not guilty of anything that means crucifixion. I'm not sending that back to Rome. He must have done something, so I'm going to beat him, and then we'll release him. But the people cried out in the 18th verse, Away with this man, release to us Bar Abbas, a man thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them again with the intent to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. The third time he said, Why? What evil has he done? Well, Pilate is very plain that the court did not find a, any crime in this Jesus. I found in him no guilt deserving death. I will punish him and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided their demand should be granted. I guess they won the shouting match. You call that justice? He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. So somebody who actually did try to overthrow the government, who actually did shed blood and kill people in the pursuit of overthrowing Rome, they took instead of Jesus. And the penalty due to that man was given to Jesus instead, whom the court had found innocent and cleared. But the people wouldn't let it be. So this is the meaning of away with this fellow. You can see in this... Um, get me back up there, come on. Psalm 22, 6, I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. Yeah, that's the way that he was treated in these mock trials. And, you know, the, the, the people that they traded for him were horrible people. And it really showed that he was... Um, despised and rejected. The next two verses of the psalm I will grab. We'll do these. Let God rescue him, is what they said. 7 through 8 of Psalm 22, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me or make faces at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let him deliver him. Let God rescue him, for he delights in him, supposedly. This is the thing that is written in Psalm 22, and incredibly, it's almost verbatim what they said when Jesus was being crucified. In Matthew 27, 39 to 44, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Also the chief priests, the scribes, the elders mocked him, saying he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel, supposedly. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. That's almost verbatim what was said in Psalm 22. It's kind of eerie if you think about this, that it never crosses anybody's mind that this is already written. That the things that they are doing and the things they are enacting are absolutely fulfilling what was written before in great detail. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the two robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way, at least at first they did. But let God rescue him is what they said. If he's so powerful, let him come down. But that's not the way that God works. And God doesn't answer our demands and does not meet our foibles and false arguments 
and philosophical end runs. At Luke 23, the record shows 35 to 39, the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him. So you learn here that the circle at this crucifixion, uh, the circle of jeerers, has the people watching. You know, they're not really that mad at him because, well, they were never mad at him. He hadn't done anything wrong. He had helped them. But the rulers were right there to attack. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And we learn the Roman soldiers also mocked him because they thought he was an insurrectionist coming up and offering him sour wine, saying, if you are the king of the Judeans, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Judeans. So they are treating him as somebody who tried to overthrow Roman authority and they acting in their office as Roman soldiers are doing what they're supposed to do setting the example for the rest of them that you don't do this. One of the criminals hanged, railed at him, saying, aren't you the anointed to save yourself and us? The other criminal had a change of heart, as recorded here, and that's a very interesting thing. Um, hard to know how that happened, but... I like to pretend, and it's, it is entirely me, it's just supposition, but I do like to pretend that he understood the reference, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, and got to thinking about it. <laughs> That's what I like to think. He reflected on Psalm 22. He heard these words again. He heard what the people were saying. That's what I think. It's just my opinion. But we know for sure, at first, he was railing against him with the other one. At the end, in, Psalm, or in Luke 23, he has had a change of heart, and he believes in the Lord. And God shows great mercy to him, which is a very touching moment. But it's not related to Psalm 22. The next thing in Psalm 22, verses 9 through 10, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. That's an interesting thing, um, and this is another one of those where you can read it, you know, you think about the psalm in which David said, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay, nor leave his soul abandoned to the underworld. Um, and yet David is, is, had died and is buried, and his tomb was with us to this day, is what Peter would say, and you can reason from that that the psalm wasn't actually about David, even though he penned it in the first person. So also with Psalm 22, there's no human alive today who was made to trust God while nursing. Children do not have consciousness. There's something special about this one. But he said, I was cast from birth, my mother's womb, you've, from my mother's womb, you've been my God. And we read about some things there that fit this very well. In Luke 2, for example, in the seventh verse is where he was born to the virgin Miriam, her firstborn, she wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laying him in a feed trough, because there's no place for them in the inn. So even though they are poor and they have nowhere to stay, they're staying with the animals in the barn, and she lays him not in a bassinet. <laughs> not to make fun of your bassinets, but you know, a feed trough. People are afraid to get on an airplane with a newborn baby. And Jesus was laid in a feed trough for whatever it's worth. God protected him, is what I'm saying. God definitely protected him from birth. In Matthew 2, the record shows 13 to 15, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. This is an interesting episode because here again, Jesus is an infant, not in control being held and carried. But the angel of the Lord tells Joseph, Rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, remain there till I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. 
He remained there until the death of Herod. And this happened to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Which is Hosea 11, verse 1, which reads, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That tells us that the reading is a spiritual one, that God has always provided for his chosen one. But it's also a fulfillment of what we read in Psalm 22. This is the time when Herod <clears throat> slaughtered the innocents in Jerusalem. And every infant two years and under was slaughtered. But Jesus was in Egypt at the time. When Herod died, 19th verse, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared again to Joseph, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, go back to the land of Israel, because those who sought the child's life are now dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went back to the land of Israel. So he's one of very few who survived um, um, an intended extermination, which is very similar, of course, to Moses, who was born at a time when they were exterminating all the male children but managed to escape. And then in Luke 2, 42 and 49, 42 is where it tells you that Jesus is 12 years old. So we started Luke 2 with his birth in verse 7. At verse 42, he's 12. 12 year old Jesus at verse 49, what had been left behind in the temple, his parents searched for him for several days. At the end of three days, they found him, and his reply was, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? So from the time he was an infant, from the time he was very small, he was cast on the Lord. From my mother's womb, you've been my God. It's what he said. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? All right, let me think. Sorry, I'm fighting the projector here. I'm currently losing. Let's grab these two and move kind of fast. Psalm 22, 15, my strength is dried up like a shard of pottery or an Elizabethan potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. This is all about dry, very dry. Why is he so dry? Well, because he's being crucified. He's losing sweat. He's losing blood. He's breathing hard. He's being held up in the heat of the sun without any clothing. So, yes, he's drying up. And it's very precise in John 19, 28. Jesus, knowing everything was complete, said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. So this is a fulfillment of Psalm 22. In another place, in Psalm 22, verse 16, he said, Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. And dogs is typically a reference to outsiders, non-Israelites, which is exactly what happened when the, Romans, uh, the Roman battalion beat him, as recorded by the Roman Mark 15. 16 to 20, the soldiers led him away inside the palace, the governor's headquarters. They called together the entire battalion. They clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him and began to salute him. Hail, king of the Judeans. And they were striking his head with a reed while he's wearing a crown of thorns, you see, and spitting on him and kneeling down in false homage, homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, which very likely hurt because his back was already bare. And uh, whatever 
coagulation or stickiness was back there would have been pulled. All these wounds would be fresh and reopened. And they put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. But he was completely encircled with nowhere to go. That's a terrible thing. But all of this is, again, um, to fulfill what was written in Psalm 22, that the detail of it is irrefutable, I think. When you look at what it said and the way it was presented and how precisely what happened to Jesus in his life was shown in uh, you know in in detail you realize this is the finger of god this is not trickery and storytelling god did this he put these things together like that and no doubt you can find some others and that's encouraged uh, i'm not against that by any means um but these are useful. And uh, for the next time, we're going to go to the transition in that psalm. I will say this. It is too often uh, seen as a very kind of down and somber psalm. And to be fair, the death of our Lord is a very somber occasion, truthfully. Um, but there is a transition point in verse 21 of that psalm where he has been rescued. And I would argue this is the point at which he has died, and we are looking at a resurrection and the hope for the future and for the church from Psalm 22, verse 21 onward. So that's going to be the next lesson on this topic. We'll look at the different ways in which... Um, this psalm is fulfilled throughout the rest of the New Testament teaching about him. So, that's where we're going. But these, I think, are useful for proving up these details, the fact that God had to do this. Uh, we didn't come up with this there was no such thing as crucifixion in David's day. He didn't know what that was. They didn't know what it was. God did this. And many other things that are like it. But this is a good example. So again, we'll go back and we'll look at the positive things that come out of this, the future that uh, the Lord sees and the reason, the hope for which he despised the shame of the cross and pressed on. Well, I appreciate your kind attention. Um, there is a lot there. And um, again, though I am not uh, the most interesting and exciting speaker, I think that the Bible is very interesting and exciting. And I think the work of God in the Psalms is very strong and a convincing thing. And it's these kinds of proofs they're genuine proofs of the existence of God, of the hand of God in the making of the Bible, and the kinds of things that everybody can see and realize, we didn't do this. Man didn't make this up. God did this. And that's the reason that it's the genesis of faith in Romans 10, 17. So I hope that you can take these um, as the encouragement that they're intended to be, and uh, perhaps as well be able to teach and use these things. Um, if you ever have a chance to talk with somebody who is um, um, you know, Jewish uh, today, and they're not probably going to be all that interested in you quoting the Gospel of Matthew. But you don't have to. You can go right back here to Psalm 22. You can go to Isaiah 53. Remember in Acts 8 where... Uh, Philip teaches the Ethiopian eunuch, and, and the eunuch is reading Isaiah 53, and it said, from this scripture, he proclaimed Jesus to him. And yes, of course, you, you have to move forward into what Jesus himself taught, as clearly Philip did, because the eunuch said, 
Look, water, what now hinders me from being baptized? And, well, nothing did. Whatever it was to preach Jesus to him included water and baptism. Even though a lot of churches don't give invitations anymore, God is still inviting people. Heaven is still there. Hell is still there, too. And no, they didn't fix the AC. That's not the problem. <laughs> people fail to mention it because it doesn't pay the bills. But the truth is, God is the one with whom we have to reckon. And in the last day, that's going to be the real answer. We see in Psalm 22 what Jesus paid and what God paid so that we might have forgiveness. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian to get forgiveness for yourself in baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. If today you are already a Christian but have not lived right, you need to repent, make the heart right with God, approach God in prayer asking for forgiveness. But also, we are glad to pray with you that you might be restored to him. We all need strength. If today you need the prayers of the saints, you need to be baptized. Please let that need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.